Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, March 20th, uh, 2018 meeting of the California High Speed Rail Authority Board is uh, brought to order. We are immediately going to go into closed session. Well, after closed session, we'll come back and continue the public portion of today's meeting and report any actions taken in closed session. Thank you. Uh, this meeting of the California High Speed Rail Authority Board will come to order. Will the secretary please call the roll? She is here, so. Here. 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 Assembly Member Arambula. Chair Richard. I'm here. Okay. Um, and I'm here. I'm sorry, <laughs> Director uh, Shank is here. Um, Director Camacho, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, we'll move first to public comment. And um, I see no comment cards. Uh, actually, that's not quite true. We start with uh, uh, public officials, elected officials, and so forth. And so we'll begin with uh, uh, Mike Murphy, the mayor of Merced, and then uh, proceed in the order in which I receive the cards uh, after that. So, Mr. Mayor, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning to the board and, and to staff. I'm Mike Murphy, the Mayor of Merced, and Merced would like to take the opportunity today to reaffirm our strong support for the California High Speed Rail Project. I'm pleased you've consistently made clear that connecting Merced is a priority. As you know, Merced stands to gain so much from increased connectivity. Connecting Merced will allow us to shape our growth and quality of life through a strengthening and diverse economy. We also believe that California will benefit from connecting Merced sooner rather than later. In addition to offering much needed housing as well as access to a quality workforce and a first rate university in UC Merced, we can increase high speed rail ridership given ACE expansion plans to Merced. These numbers could be significant and I encourage us all to further analyze increased ridership resulting from ACE expansion. Finally, connecting Merced provides you the authority the opportunity to fully consider siting the heavy maintenance facility in Merced. Merced has made clear our desire to compete for the heavy maintenance facility. Siting the heavy maintenance facility in Merced will achieve all of your project goals and cost far less than doing so in more impacted areas of the Central Valley. Connecting high-speed rail to Merced is mutually benef beneficial to Merced and to our state. And this relationship serves as the basis of our strong working relationship. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Chairman Richard, members of the board, and the California High Speed Rail executives and staff for our partnership and look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before we go to our next speaker, um, uh, I should have clarified one thing, which is that uh, while we always have a public comment period uh, at the beginning of our High Speed Rail board meetings, uh, we also, this public comment period today is also serving uh, as part of the public comment process on our 2018 business plan. The draft 2018 business plan was issued on March 9th. And Mayor, uh, if it's all right, I'd like to make sure that your comments are incorporated as part of the record of public comment on the draft uh, 2018 business plan. I think that's what you intended. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, we will be having other uh, public comment periods at uh, future board uh, uh, meetings, which will uh, exceed the minimum requirements under the statute, but we'd like to afford the public the maximum opportunity to participate in this uh, business planning process. Uh, so with that, I'll move through to uh, the next speakers. Uh, next is Steve Roberts from the 
uh, Rail Passenger Association of California. He'll be followed by uh, Ted Hart and then Lisa Larrabee. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Steve Roberts, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Rail Passenger Association of California. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. First, we compliment the authority on its straightforward presentation of the project's current status as reflected in the updated business plan. Despite the challenges outlined, RailPAC continues to strongly support this project. Uh, RailPAC uh, believes that the high-speed rail continues to be the best value in increased mobility in California. Uh, our board members noted the reality is that any other alternative would face the same challenges in, in inflation, the litigation, right-of-way issues that, as the current project and the no-build alternative is not a viable alternative. That said, RailPAC feels that the authority must ensure that something of benefit and transformational uh, is built in Southern California. That key project is noted in the business plan as LA Union Station run through tracks, linked us. This project will tra transform commuter rail in Southern California. However, RailPAC is concerned that LA Metro not only does, isn't a champion of the project, but is showing signs of gold plating it, focusing on retail, and eventually making Linktus unaffordable, at which point they will try to spend the MOUs on other bright, shiny uh, objects. This must not happen. RailPAC asks the authority and the board to assist RailPAC in championing Linktus. Finally, RailPAC believes the authority should establish a stretch goal of outlining a funding plan to close the gap between Chowchilla and Gilroy by this time next year. Without this, RailPAC fears the confidence in the project and its public support will suffer significant erosion. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Ted Hart, followed by Lisa Larrabee, followed by Roland Lebrun. Good morning, Mr. Hart. Good morning. Uh, I would be commenting on the uh, 2018 draft business plan. The plan opens with a letter from CEO Brian Kelly and, quote, 10 years ago when the state went to the polls to decide whether the system would, excuse me, I've got my glasses are <laughs> locked up here. Um, to decide whether that the state should build a high-speed rail system, they voted yes. They did so because they recognized that an environmentally clean, fast, and efficient high-speed rail system would, and then et cetera, et cetera. Fifty-one percent voted yes, but you failed to acknowledge what they voted for is not what they got. Millions of voters consulted the 2008 voter information guide before making a decision. Voting yes, the voters authorized 9.95 billion in bonds, funds to construct an 800 mile statewide rail system to cost about $45 billion with the balance from the feds, private investors and others. A yes established an agreement between the voter and high-speed rail, an agreement which the high-speed rail authority has broken. In 2018, 10 years later, these costs increased to an unbelievable $120 billion for an entire statewide rail system, and there's no evidence of outside funding to complete the project. This amounts to approximately $3,000 for every man, woman, and child in the state and will cost a family of four approximately $12,000 for the right to then buy a ticket to ride on the train. I stood before this board in 2009, 2012, 2014, and 2016 and brought up these same concerns regarding the cost and funding. Those concerns have never been addressed. Why not? Those yes voters deserve transparency. They need to weigh in on an outcome for which they did not vote yes. In following Brian Kelly's recent statements regarding complete transparency, 
I request the following sentence be placed in the front of the 2018 business plan. Quote, the cost of the 800-mile statewide rail system is now estimated to be about $120 billion, and we are unable to identify the sources of funding necessary to complete this project. My reason for this request is that all 106 pages of the 2018 business plan are irrelevant until this statement is addressed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Um, Lisa Larrabee, followed by Roland LeBrun, and then Ivor Sampson. Good morning, Ms. Larrabee. Good morning. I'm uh, CEO, Lisa Larrabee, CEO of Harrison Associates, representing the Wong Harris JV for the CP1 PCM services. And I'm a slight ext extrovert, thus I'm at the podium. Um, my partner here, Cliff Wong, is also in the audience. I just would like to make a few comments to address the board in terms of an articulation and an affirmation of the commitment the PCM has in respect to the CP1 alignment and segment of the high-speed rail project. We've been there since the beginning and we're fully committed to the successful outcome of the services that are being proposed in item number four. We have 38 people present in Fresno, fully dedicated to the project, including uh, minority businesses, small businesses, and other subconsultants represented that live and are fully dedicated to high-speed rail and Fresno, also known as the gateway to Yosemite, which is becoming a very vibrant community as a result of this project. If the board does approve item number four with respect to the extension of our contract, you'll look forward to enhanced teamwork between the PCM, the RDP, and high-speed rail and the new leadership that you've put in place for the successful outcome of this project. And I wanna put in terms high functioning teamwork that will improve upon your experience to date. With respect to this item, if you are to approve this extension, we will have greater security and able to attract talent to this important project. You will be able to provide the security of careers that are fully dedicated to Fresno and the high-speed rail project. And just a footnote on a personal note, my mother's maiden name was Jean Hopkins. She's a descendant, and therefore I am a descendant of Mark Hopkins, who is the treasurer of the Central Pacific Railroad, an early pioneer that drives in my blood as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Roland LeBrun, followed by Ivor Sampson, once, not twice, Ivor and uh, Leanne Eager. Good morning, Mr. Richard and uh, directors, and a uh, nice warm welcome to Mr. Brian Kelly. Welcome to the party. So today, I'd like to start on a high note and to thank you and your staff for recognizing that the San Jose to Guerrero Corridor is a high-density 125-mile-an-hour corridor. But the thing I really want to talk to you about today is what happened to the valley to valley connection and how we're going to put it back in the plan. Because a plan without a connection between Fresno and Silicon Valley is not a plan. It's an admission of failure. So let's start with what happened to Fresno in CP1 and what a gentleman by the name of Richard Tormack, which Ms. Shank might remember uh, him appearing in front of the board eight years ago. And what Richard said to this board is that the 54-mile section between Fresno and Corcoran had more viaducts than 1,000 miles of French high-speed lines. So the question is, what is the real issue here? It is not Mr. Hill's contracts, and it's certainly not the 1,500 people who are currently hard at work delivering this project. The real issue is the project itself, namely a fatally flawed alignment aimed at the heart of cities on the route instead of an alignment that bypasses cities 
and use its existing rail infrastructure to connect to downtown station to connect downtown stations to the high speed line so what is the solution 20 years ago the alignment was i5 and the connect can i finish yes and the connection between i5 and silicon valley was panoche panoche pass not pacheco it was a faster shorter and cheaper route that requires 10 miles less tunnels than Pacheco Pass. Please revisit this alignment, including a branch connection to Fresno via Highway 180 or the existing UP Freight line, instead of wasting any more money between Fresno and Bakersfield. And when you do, you will discover an alignment that is not only the shortest and the fastest between Fresno and Silicon Valley, but it also leaves the door open to future private investment on I-5. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rubron. <clears throat> Ivor Sampson, then Leanne Eager. Um, Ivor, I know you're here on behalf of two clients, but just go ahead and, and make your remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Ivor Sampson with Dentons, and I'm appearing on behalf of two clients the first is the Bakersfield Homeless Center, and the second is the Fresno Rescue Mission. And I will be brief in my comments because you've heard them many times before. Uh, the Bakersfield Homeless Center is located on Truxton Avenue, just south of Bakers downtown Bakersfield. Uh, for roughly three years from sometime in 2014 through 2017, there were discussions with the high-speed rail where the rail authority offered to purchase the property as an early acquisition. Uh, those discussions were moving along until uh, September of last year when uh, the center was told that there was no longer going to be funding available at the direction of the Board of Public Works. In fact, that it even gotten to the point where an appraisal, uh, appraiser was hired by the authority and a, an appraisal was done. Um, there was a 180 degree switch last September. We tried to meet with the Board of Public Works. The Board of Public Works has refused to meet with us. The uh, Bakersfield Homeless Center has relied for three plus years on the representations that an acquisition was going to be made in terms of deferring capital improvements, things like that. Um, in January, uh, at the suggestion of uh, Ms. Gomez, uh, or through the cooperation of Ms. Gomez, I should say, uh, we met with Assembly Member Salas, Ms. Gomez, and others from the authority regarding if, how to make this acquisition come about. And we were told to address it in the upcoming business plan. I realize the business plan is complicated. There's a lot of things in play, and we intend to file written comments uh, on the business plan uh, before the cutoff date. And those comments will essentially be to the effect that we request that the business plan include the acquisition of the Bakersfield Homeless Center. If high-speed rail is ever intending to go south of Bakersfield, then the Homeless Center is on the route and it is a necessary acquisition and for reasons of equity, if nothing else, for reasons of representations that were made, if nothing else, we request that this acquisition be made sooner rather than later, and I know that I'll have the opportunity to address you again after our written comments are submitted. Okay. Let me turn next to the Fresno Rescue Mission, if I may. In July of 2016, we entered into a temporary relocation uh, agreement. The high-speed rail is essentially wiping out the mission's 11 buildings, which uh, sit on roughly 13 acres. Um, we, we have to have a seamless operation. Uh, the day that we shut down, you have to have new buildings up and operating uh, to serve the homeless community, both in terms of meal, shelter, health care, and so on. So we entered into a temporary relocation agreement that basically said, we're going to put up temporary buildings. Uh, we will vacate the premises 
uh, so that high-speed rail can have possession uh, 21 days after those temporary buildings are erected and ready for occupancy. And that's really moving forward pretty fast. Uh, we understand probably <coughs> end of March, early April, that the county will issue whatever necessary occupancy certificates uh, are required. We have tried to be cooperative. Uh, we have worked hard with high-speed rail staff, and I must say that Ms. Gomez and her crew uh, have been very cooperative. There's been issues, but we work hard to work them out. One place where we've had tremendous difficulty, tremendous difficulty, is on the relocation plan. The temporary relocation plan that was implemented to allow us to move into the temporary structures has been a nightmare in its implementation. I don't know if it is attitude or, quite frankly, sheer incompetence on the part of the consultants that the authority has retained, but bills are not being paid. The mission right now is funding its own move, which should be paid for by federal relocation funds. Uh, we're in the hole about 400 and some thousand dollars. There is a meeting tomorrow to address this. Um, it, it, it has reached a crisis point. I understand that new consultants have been brought on board, and I only hope that will be better. But this has left a very, very bad taste, and that's the politest way that I can put it. Uh, to avoid these past problems, uh, on October 19th, I wrote to the chairman requesting that the board adopt a resolution that quoted exactly from the mitigation language in your adopted EIR, EIS as it related to relocation and mitigation. I quoted the exact language and asked that that be adopted in the resolution. I got no response. That was an opportunity for a win-win to assure the mission that the adopted measures will be impl implemented and it would allow us to move forward on a permanent relocation agreement, which is absolutely necessary. I came here in November and gave the same statement effectively that I'm giving today. Uh, I heard nothing. I came here in January, gave the same statement again. I've gotten no response, no follow-up to my letter, no follow-up to the statements that I made in November and January, and I'm here again today. At, at the very least, just as a matter of respect, it's discourteous not to respond. At worst, it sends a very, very bad signal about the High Speed Rail Authority's integrity and your commitment to your adopted mitigation measures. It's creating an unnecessary confrontation. It's very, very bad optics for the authority, which you don't need, and this could be a win-win situation if you would at least consider a resolution that does no more than reaffirm that which you have already adopted. And I guess I'm here to say, please consider the resolution that I submitted. If you won't do that, at least have the courtesy of getting back to me and telling me that you won't do it and explain why. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. We will do that. Um, so Thank you, we'll Mr. Chairman. That. Okay, Leanne Eager, uh, followed by Chuck Riojas. Good morning. I'm Leanne Eager, President and CEO of Fresno County Economic Development Corporation. Um, so I have to say a little something first. So uh, you might have seen recently in the Fresno Bee that they did an article about if you are from Fresno, you need to support high-speed rail. Um, and I was quoted in there often with my uh, with examples of, of why high-speed rail is good for the valley. Um, online, there were some responses on there, which you might have expected. One of them called me a Pollyanna. Uh, I think I've heard that here before, too. Um, and I just have to say that uh, having been a creditor's rights attorney and doing economic development during the recession, I think Pollyanna left me a long time ago. Um, my response uh, to the, the 
current business plan um, is certainly I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. And thank you so much, Mr. Kelly, for uh, putting together a transparent document that shows exactly what had happened in the past and where we need to go in the future. Um, and I, for one, do not want a bargain basement system. I don't want us to go back and say, okay, well, we could actually do it for $68 billion, but it's not going to be the system that we need in California. We need to do it right. And if it costs more to do it right, then we need to do that. So thank you so much for putting that into effect. Um, recently, I was asked by uh, the Secretary Ross, not the California one, but the Washington DC one, Wilbur, uh, to put together a, a white paper on why high-speed rail is important for the Central Valley. And so I gave you a copy of that. It's the two-page one. Um, what he's using that for is when they're putting together um, where they're going to be spending money and in infrastructure in the United States. Uh, my, my role was why they should put it in the Central Valley and why they should put it in our transportation project. So I gave you a copy of what I sent them. Um, and also for uh, the state of California had asked me to do a, a one pager um, on the pro for high speed rail for the Central Valley. And so I, I gave you that one too. Um, and that was for the treasury. Um, the other really positive thing is that the, the CalEd organization, which is the California Organization for All Economic Developers, uh, just had their annual uh, meeting. And in that, they gave away awards for uh, the best projects in the state of California. So I'd like Diana Gomez to come down. Um, we were uh, awarded uh, the Partnership Award from CalEd uh, that is the partnership between High Speed Rail and the Economic Development Corporation in the city and county of Fresno um, for our High Speed Rail Business Support Program that we've had in effect, I think, for the last four years, yes? Um, and uh, they gave us the award for uh, really showing the epitome of how partnerships can work well, especially for businesses um, in the state of California. So Diana, and I are going to share this in Fresno. We'll pass it back and forth to each other. Um, but we wanted to make sure that you knew you were a part of uh, this really special award um, for partnerships in the state of California. Thank you. Very good. Congratulations, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eager. Um, our last speaker is uh, Chuck Riojas of the Building Trades. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me an opportunity to speak today. I was here at for the legislative conference and heard this meeting was this morning, so I took advantage of being in Sacramento um, to basically uh, hopefully give you a good update on what we've been doing in the Central Valley with regards to high-speed rail. To date, I, I, I came before you years ago looking for pre-apprenticeship opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities on high-speed rail. We have moved the ball significantly forward since then. We have put on, in the recent three, four years probably, 22 classes in 10 counties in the Central Valley. 22 classes roughly equates to 450 participants, people coming from welfare to work, helmets to hard hats, wherever they find themselves in, the, in their stage of life, uh, gaining access to apprenticeship, gaining access to the trades. Of those 450, roughly 500 participants, we have a high 80 percentile placement rate. Not all of them in apprenticeship, but in jobs, real jobs. All of these I attribute to the success of high-speed rail in the Central Valley. Without it, without this particular project, this narrative, we wouldn't be able to draw down the funds for the pre-apprenticeship training. Uh, I'd like to publicly thank Blake Consul from the, the California or the Fresno Workforce Investment Board. I've been fortunate here this last year to be appointed to the California Workforce Board. So Mr. Tim Rainey and others are, are highly successful in, in drawing down these funds. What I'd like to impart to you is we are being responsible with those funds, targeting those demographics that call for in the CBA for high-speed rail. We're putting on the classes uh, and having good, good, great success with it. I am happy to report that we've been doing it to, to the level, and I hope to come back in June or July. This year, June 1st, we are turning out five people to journeymanship who started five and a half years ago as pre-apprentices in the respective metal trades, the electrical, sheet metal, and plumbing. 
So I hope to be able to come back to you, hopefully with them, and they can come and tell you their story, how a, a project like this not only benefits the community, but it truly benefits the citizens of that community because of the foresight that you guys had as a board to participate and elect and to, to accept the CBA and give us the opportunity to do pre-apprenticeship. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Riojas, and thank you for your work on that. Um, uh, I think certainly speaking for myself, but I suspect others, uh, it's very gratifying to think about the number of people whose lives have been changed by getting uh, good uh, employment at good wages on this program. So we appreciate that. Uh, with that, um, I have no more requests for public speaking, so the um, somebody's got their hand up, but uh, we, we were delayed due to the traffic at Silicon Valley. Would you uh, give a comment <laughs> card to this person and we'll, we'll accommodate you since you've come a long way? Okay. Why don't you make your way to the microphone, sir? Thank you. Mr. Jim Schmidt. Yes. Uh, I'm a commercial broker uh, working in Silicon Valley, and I was delayed by the traffic That's in Silicon fine, sir. Valley. Go ahead and make your comments. Uh, I wanted to point out uh, the editorial in this morning's San Jose Mercury. The bullet train is a solution in search of a problem. Uh, as you probably know, and all of us know, there's a lot of negative talk about the bullet train. The fact, the problem, the biggest problem is Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is so crowded. The houses are ridiculously high in price. The traffic is getting crazy. The high-speed rail is a solution to Silicon Valley's problems. But it seems to me that the high-speed rail is not gone into the companies and talked about their expansion along 152 and out into the valley. This is critical to Silicon, to Silicon Valley, but it seems to me it's also critical to the high-speed rail. You've got to get into a partnership with the companies in Silicon Valley to find out what they want and where they want it. The idea of locating a satellite operation in Madeira is probably not high on their list. But there are places that are a lot closer, right on high, I-5 and 152, that would be very attractive, I think, to a high-tech company to perhaps locate a Silicon Valley extension. So I think you, it's very important to use the uh, companies in, in Silicon Valley to tell you what they need to expand into the valley. It's gonna be good for Fresno, it's gonna be good for Bakersfield, but most of us up there don't really feel a need for a high-speed rail from San Francisco to LA. I mean, what does that do for me? It doesn't do much, but I've got a traffic problem, I've got a housing problem, I've got a crowding problem, I can't, I can't employ people because they can't afford to live in Silicon Valley, and you guys have got the solutions at your hand, but you've gotta put it more into your game plan. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming up here today. I'm sure that was difficult and, from Silicon Valley. And, and I'll give you a card if you uh, want to follow up Why don't you up give that? it to uh, uh, this, uh, the, the board secretary here? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Okay. With that, um, that does uh, conclude the public comment period, both the public comment period for the business plan and the coterminous public comment period for uh, today's board meeting. I want to thank uh, everyone for coming and sharing their thoughts today. <coughs> With that, um, we will turn to the regular agenda. But before we do, uh, this is the first meeting of the authority uh, where we have uh, the benefit of the leadership of our new CEO, Mr. Brian Kelly. Uh, I'm just delighted that he's uh, sitting up here with us. I'm um, even more delighted that he's taken on this uh, tremendous challenge and uh, uh, one of his first daunting uh, tasks was to deliver a draft business plan on a date certain uh, and uh, he, he led the staff to do that. So I want to welcome Brian Kelly and, and uh, Mr. Kelly and give you an opportunity to um, make some remarks, introduce your leadership team. Great. Thank you Mr. Chairman, board members. Um, we've had the opportunity to talk some time ago. I'm uh, very 
pleased to take on this challenge, and, and this is uh, quite a challenge. But um, uh, I guess you su su suspect or expect no less uh, for a project that is of this magnitude and can present the benefits it can present to the people of the state of California. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm actually blessed to be part of this challenge because I think it's that important for the future of the state. And uh, I really welcome the opportunity and thank the board for, the op for, the, for this chance. I also want to just take a moment, if I could, Mr. Chairman, to introduce our new chief operating officer who uh, we brought on board uh, in February, and that's Joe Hedges, who's sitting right over there. Uh, Joe and I have rolled up our sleeves and are uh, getting to work, uh, not just up in Sacramento, but he's been down to the field a couple of times already. He'll be going back again soon uh, to assure that we can uh, uh, meet all of our commitments on this project and uh, keep the work going. So very happy Joe is here. And while she's not here today, I also brought over uh, Pam Mizukami, uh, who came over uh, and is a chief deputy to me and helping with, uh, oh, she is there. Hi, Pam. Uh, uh, and uh, Pam has come over and she's a part of our, important part of our leadership team to help on the contract management side and uh, along with some of our uh, HR issues. So I'm very pleased that Pam has come over with us. Sitting next to Pam, I think, is Jeannie Jones. Is that Jeannie there? Yeah, Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie is our new Chief Administrative Officer, who we just brought over as well, too. So we are in the middle of change, but it's good change, and we're bringing in high-caliber high talent uh, to help us move this project forward. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for taking this journey with me, and uh, I look forward to making progress in the days ahead. Thank you, Brian, and uh, I'm glad you introduced Pam and Jeannie, so at least one of us has some hair. Um. <laughs> I was going to ask. Cheap shot, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Joe or Brian and I will be doing any hair care product commercials anytime soon. Okay, um, we'll turn now to the uh, regular agenda. Item one is consideration of approval of the board minutes from the January 16th uh, board forward. meeting of this year. Been moved by Director Camacho. Second. Second by uh, Director Shank. <coughs> Will Secretary please call the roll? Director Shank? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Is your mic on, Krista? Go ahead. Mm. Well, how's, how's that? Yes. There you go. I'm gonna, I'll start over. Director Shank? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Director Curtin? Yes. Director <clears throat> Paskett? Yes. Director Lowenthal? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Chair Richard? Yes, thank you. Okay, item two is um, a report uh, by Mr. Kelly and the staff on the draft 2018 business plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm gonna do the best I can uh, here to both uh, control the screen behind me and present as I'm facing this way. Uh, I have a, a PowerPoint document that will go through some of the highlights of the, the business plan, uh, 2018 draft business plan, which uh, we produced uh, and released publicly on March 9th. A couple of high-level issues about the process we're in in this business plan. It is required uh, under current law, under the Public Utilities Code, Section 85033. Represents the status of the program at this point in time. Summarizes our approach to implementing the system. And it includes the following elements that are required under the statute. Updated capital cost and other estimates. Updated ridership and revenue forecasts. A summary of progress over the last couple of years. And a review of our current challenges and how we address them. Uh, this year, the final draft is due to the legislature uh, by June 1st, uh, 2018. Uh, what we have kicked off with the release of the draft plan is a 60-day uh, public comment period. This is the first uh, public hearing where we review the draft at a high level. Uh, we are looking forward to legislative hearings in the beginning of April, uh, at least two, maybe three uh, there. And of course, we'll have opportunity for further comment as we have uh, board hearings uh, in April uh, before a final adoption by this board uh, in May of 2018. So we really are at the front end of the public comment period and the adoption of the final uh, draft 2018 plan. I'm just gonna roll through some of the important elements uh, of the plan here and of course open to any questions uh, that uh, the board may have. The first important part uh, that I wanna uh, say about this plan is that it does reiterate uh, our current commitments. Uh, it was stated earlier that uh, 
The voters did approve Proposition 1A in 2008, and with that came an expectation to build uh, the statewide phase one system uh, outlined in that bond measure. And our commitment is reiterated in this plan that that is our objective, uh, and that's the direction that, that, that we will head. Uh, consistent with the 2016 plan, uh, we advocated in this plan the delivery of the Silicon Valley to Central Valley line, known as the Valley to Valley line. Um, there is a, a, a bit of a change from the 2016 plan in that we are really describing the Valley to Valley line here as San Francisco to Bakersfield. Uh, having our southern termina termina termination point uh, be in the city of Bakersfield and making some investments uh, north of San Jose to assure that we can get a ride uh, all the way into San Francisco. As we stated in 2016, Merced as a connecting point remains a high priority. Just as our challenge was in 2016, that too. just as our challenge was in 2016, um, uh, there is a, an issue with identifying additional funding uh, to incorporate the Merced uh, uh, point as soon as we can. And of course, we continue planning, working with the local and regional partners on phase two extensions, both Merced to Sacramento and in Southern California, Los Angeles to San Diego via the Inland Empire. Um, our commitment here in this plan is to continue to work with our valued partners to advance the modern and integrated statewide rail network. Uh, just a moment on this, Mr. Chairman. It is important, I think, to remind uh, folks that this project has really been part of a broader effort in this state to modernize uh, rail and passenger rail transit in, in California. The electrification of Caltrain is an example of that, uh, but what's important is that this become the spine or the centerpiece of a, a high-speed network that connects seamlessly and well uh, with regional and local uh, transit and rail providers up and down the state. This is probably best articulated in the state rail plan, which is uh, a draft has been out and is now forthcoming uh, by the California State Transportation Agency, who has worked with partners up and down the state uh, to lay out a vision for uh, increased passenger rail travel in California going forward with the high-speed rail system uh, as the core of the spine of that, uh, that, that approach. This, uh, this business plan offers a very candid discussion uh, about our challenges. Um, we, of course, are Im implementing a series of uh, complex and integrated mega projects. Even the, the smallest things on this project in terms of the total scope are big, difficult, tough uh, infrastructure projects to deliver. Uh, our initial challenge is the 119-mile stretch uh, in the Central Valley. And if you think about that, any single transportation project that's 119 miles long makes it about the longest uh, anywhere in the country, uh, just that part alone. Uh, and you drive that, it takes two hours simply to drive the project. So this, the, the smallest elements uh, of this are big and are challenging. We face the same challenges that international projects of similar magnitude and complexity have successfully addressed. And those include everything from cost, uh, schedule, scope. Uh, and, and some of those are outlined in our plan as the challenges that we are now facing. Our draft business plan shows that our cost estimates have increased. Uh, we need greater certainty on funding, and our delivery schedule has been extended. Those are all uh, very clear in the plan, and we use the plan to then identify not just these challenges, but provide a strategy for moving forward. On the revised cost estimates uh, that, again, are outlined in the plan, it's first uh, noteworthy to say that about 83 percent of the higher costs are driven by, one, uh, the previously identified Central Valley uh, construction uh, delays and cost issues that this board first aired publicly uh, back in January, uh, estimated at a $2.8 billion uh, increase that, of course, rolls into and affects uh, the cost for the entire uh, project. Uh, inflation tied to the schedule delays. Um, because we're pushing out the schedule on some of these, we have a greater impact on uh, costs due to inflation. And of course, we establish higher contingency that better reflect <coughs> the risk and uncertainty. One of the things that we outline in this plan rather candidly is that for much of the program outside of the Central Valley segment, uh, we are early uh, in project development work. We are still in the environmental process on much of it and we are on the front end of refining design further to really uh, get a solid, uh, uh, more refined sense of what actual costs will be. Uh, this plan recognizes that, and, uh, and, and in our cost estimates, you see increased contingency to deal with uh, some of that risk and uncertainty that's still out there. 
We have new baseline estimates that are articulated in this plan for each element of the statewide uh, phase one program. Uh, the first, as I mentioned earlier, which was uh, described by this board in January, uh, are cost increases uh, in the Central Valley. Uh, that uh, is now estimated at a 10.6 billion as the uh, uh, cost to complete uh, uh, undertaken uh, by the RD, our regional delivery partner in 2017 and again aired uh, in January by this board. That's about a $2.8 billion increase in that segment alone. Uh, and our intention is to move forward and deliver that section by 2022 consistent with our uh, agreements with the federal government who are our key funding partners on that stretch of the uh, program. Silicon Valley to Central Valley line is estimated in, in this program, the Valley to Valley at 29.5 billion with an opening date of 2029. Uh, it is a, worthwhile to note uh, that this is a, a, a 1.9 billion of this is tied to the redefinition of what we mean by Valley to Valley, uh, where in 2016 uh, the board had described that as uh, north of Bakersfield to San Jose, uh, we are clarifying here that we see uh, we see the southern terminus in Bakersfield itself, uh, with a, a ride option all the way into San Francisco coming north, and the phase one estimate is moved to 77.3 billion with a cost to complete or sorry with a completion uh, date assumed of 2033. Um, there is a new approach in this plan uh, that uh, has not been part of prior business plans, but that. Uh, I certainly think is important um, and that we have uh, applied to this, uh, this business plan and that is to apply ranges to the stage of the projects and to our cost estimates. As I mentioned earlier, and the plan goes into some detail, some uh, much detail on this. Um, because we're fairly early in the project development process on elements of this program, uh, simply uh, putting out a dollar sign and trying to stick to that. Uh, is not sufficient in my view in terms of how, trying to estimate where we are and where costs might go. So this program includes both the low uh, and a high against our base estimate of costs. Uh, again, these numbers here, 10.6, 29.5 are a re redefined valley to valley and the 77.3 are our best estimates to date and we ha it establishes a base case for us. Uh, but we also think it's important because there is sufficient uh, unknown and risk, uh, particularly with uh, phase one and the total of valley to valley, that we apply uh, ranges and the, the, the plan does that. Uh, we are working in, a, in an environment with some uncertain uh, funding that is part of this program and, you know, candidly from my perspective that has been uh, a trademark of this program uh, ever since the voters uh, passed Prop 1A in uh, 2008. As it was stated earlier, on the day that passed, uh, the uh, uh, voter pamphlet suggested the cost for phase one at 45 billion, and the bond provided nine. So uh, since that time, it's been a, uh, a process of uh, how you develop this to provide benefits as you go. Uh, you build this generally in an incremental way, uh, and you uh, do work to find uh, funding partners as you go uh, to be able to develop the, the, the project. And uh, we see that here as well. So um, we, are, we do talk in the program about de de delivering this program involving, it, it does involve major procurements and long lead times. Uh, currently, uh, the program has been operating on a pay-as-you-go approach to funding, which is really our federal commitment already made, uh, our Prop 1A dollars that remain uh, and a cap and trade funding that was assumed originally in the 2016 business plan and has been uh, affirmed by the legislature last, last year. Uh, those have been the sources of funding and the 2016 business plan in order to complete the Valley to Valley system uh, proposed that the cap and trade uh, revenues uh, be financed uh, so that uh, you can bring dollars forward and uh, invest in the capital needs to build the project uh, in, a, in, a, in a timeline that uh, is sooner. It's very difficult to build a project of this magnitude on strictly a pay-as-you-go basis. So again, the 2016 business plan raised the prospects that we would need to finance uh, the cap-and-trade revenue stream, and the draft 2018 plan is consistent uh, with that assumption. There has been some important progress here in 26, uh, in 20, since the 2016 plan. Uh, most notably, last year in 2017, the legislature passed and the governor signed AB 398, 
which uh, extended the cap and trade trade program from 2020 uh, to 2030, allowing a you know 10 more years of revenue, 25 percent of which, uh, on a statewide basis, is dedicated uh, to this program. Um, and that was a very important step to solidify additional funding so that we can continue to move forward. Over the next two years, we're going to uh, we propose in the plan to continue to advance the system with this current and committed funding, and we're, we will be working with the legislature and the Department of Finance to explore options to create an investment grade financing stream, just as we raised in 2016 and are uh, staying with that approach in uh, 2018. Um, there is uh, an approach in the business plan as well uh, to not just show our costs in ranges, but also to show our funding stream, particularly from cap and trade in, range, in, in ranges, because those revenues uh, come from uh, uh, an auction. Uh, uh, they can vary. They have varied in the past. Uh, it's worth noting that since AB 398 passed, those auctions have stabilized uh, and revenues have been uh, strong. I believe the last four auctions has raised on the order of $670 million uh, for the project. Um, and so that is solidifying. The ranges that we use here are relatively conservative. Uh, there's a, a wide swing in what cap and trade could bring over the next several years. And um, uh, we are the bot toward the bottom of that string, uh, swing uh, using a range between 500 and 750 million uh, out of cap and trade for this project. Of course, uh, because we're operating in a world of uncertainty, uh, there is uh, uh, a requirement which I will get into uh, as we go further into this, this presentation and would note that the business plan spends uh, a bit of time, an entire chapter, in fact, on laying out some of the lessons we've learned, the places that we have to do business differently going forward. And I'm going to talk about some of those things uh, shortly here. But before I do, there are three fundamental goals that were established uh, in 2016, and perhaps even earlier, but, but certainly affirmed publicly in 2016 with how we move forward on this program. Uh, because you don't have all the funding you need in hand right now to build everything you want, uh, you have to lay out your, your process and your steps and, and how you will build as you move forward. Uh, the three principles that had been established by this board before included, one, initiating high-speed rail service in California as soon as possible. Second, making strategic concurrent investments that will be linked over time and provide early mobility, economic, and environmental benefits as soon as possible to the public and the taxpayers. And three, to position ourselves to construct additional segments as funding becomes available. Those three principles were established uh, some time ago, were reported in the 2016 business plan, and they still remain a part of our approach going forward. So in a world of uh, some uh, uncertain funding and uncertain costs, uh, how do you move forward? And the plan lays out specifically uh, our priorities and our steps in developing this project. The first is a commitment to meet uh, all of our funding commitments with our federal funding partner, the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, uh, they've been important partners for us in getting the project going in the Central Valley. Uh, they remain important partners for us as we move forward in the, in the Central Valley and beyond. Uh, and we have a, a funding agreement with them that requires us to perform. And so uh, our commitment first is to get the 119-mile stretch in the Central Valley completed uh, and to complete all of the environmental documentation uh, necessary for all segments of the project statewide uh, under our grant agreement with the FRA. Uh, second is to extend the Silicon Valley to define the Valley to Valley uh, system as, the San, as uh, extending uh, Silicon Valley to Central Valley uh, to San Francisco in the north and Bakersfield in the south. This was contemplated in 2016, but now that we've advanced the ball uh, on the environmental question in Bakersfield, and we see some opportunity uh, to make uh, some modest investments in the north on the, along the electrified corridor with Caltrain, uh, we have an opportunity to get uh, a ride between San Francisco and Bakersfield uh, in an efficient way. Uh, and defining valley to valley this way also ties to the highest revenue and the highest ridership uh, scenario for valley to valley service. So we really embrace that in the 2018 plan. We do propose, uh, because of the funding uncertainty, uh, we do uh, propose uh, to make 
uh, investments, uh, both in the Central Valley side uh, and, as I said, on the electrification side uh, in the peninsula by exten extending, first on the peninsula side, extending the electrification uh, of the San Jose San Francisco project further south uh, to Gilroy. Uh, and then in the Central Valley, the 119 mile stretch, ultimately with an extension to Bakersfield. Uh, to, at a minimum, uh, to start t testing trains in the Central Valley and examining uh, what kind of service we might be able to put in play uh, in the Central Valley connecting to the Amtrak service going north so that we can deliver through this plan at least 224 miles of high-speed rail-ready infrastructure uh, that uh, may be able to see passenger service as soon as 2027. This approach of investing on the Central Valley side and investing and extending the electrification project on the <coughs> Silicon Valley to Gilroy side really isolates our largest challenge as the, the thing we, we need to focus on going forward, and that is the, tunnel, the tunneling uh, in the Pacheco Pass area as a final piece to complete the Silicon Valley to Central Valley service. Uh, we would also concurrently with this process continue our early bookend investments in Southern and Northern California in the north, we are investing in the uh, Caltrain electrification project. In the south, we have, uh, prior to this business plan, we have uh, uh, adopted a, uh, a dedication of a book and dollars, 76 million, for an important grade separation down there, Rosecrans Marquat grade separation, uh, which is a project that is very important for freight and passenger rail in Southern California. The extension, the expansion of that rail and safety. Uh, to the public, it has been rated as one of the uh, the uh, uh, great separation state of California that is in need of uh, uh, sort of had the highest safety uh, concern with it. And so the the board has put 76 million out for that already, and we propose to continue investments in Southern California in this plan uh, by working closely with our Southern California partners to invest in the development of the LA Union Station uh, to expand regional and local uh, systems there and make sure that that. Uh, the station expansion can accommodate uh, high-speed rail service. And of course, we remain committed to completing the phase one system. What that means for us is we finish the environmental work on each of those segments. Uh, we can continue to be, through the state's commitment of its funding to this project, uh, be in a position to take advantage of further uh, federal or uh, private partnership programs that would help us um, uh, deliver the, the phase one system. These, uh, these next few slides, uh, I might skip through a little bit quickly, but they, they sort of go through what I just outlined, uh, which are the, se the segmental or the incremental approach to, to building the Valley to Valley system. The first, as I said, is just the, uh, co uh, completing our commitment and dedicating ourselves to meeting our commitment with our federal partner, which is completing the 119 mile segment and completing environmental reviews for the entire phase one system. Uh, that that 119 mile stretch really begins the phase Silicon Valley to Central Valley line. Uh, as I said earlier, the investment of uh, dollars on the Central Valley side and through the uh, peninsula side, San Francisco to San Jose all the way to Gilroy, uh, has us in a position where uh, you've got 224 miles of high speed rail ready infrastructure on each side of the Pacheco Pass. And we focus our efforts on isolating the pass tunnels as the things that we need to to, uh, to focus both uh, further design work on, uh, uh, all the things that you do in project development uh, to uh, de-risk the project through geotechnical work, uh, identifying and acquiring right-of-way, uh, refining designs and doing all these things to really get our hand, hands around uh, the scope and the necessary uh, system that will need, need to be in place for the tunnels in the Pacheco Pass. So early work to de-risk that engage further expertise on the design of the tunnel, and explore a full funding strategy for that last element of the Valley to Valley system. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, Merced and the connections to Merced remain a high priority as they were in 2020, or sorry, in 2016, uh, and we will continue to work uh, on identifying funding for that element. Uh, the Valley to Valley system under this program would be uh, operational uh, by 2029. Um, as I mentioned on the next slide here, we also would continue to make important investments in Southern California. This sort of depicts those. There's a 45-mile corridor uh, with statewide significance between Anaheim and Burbank. 
that we have been partners with the BNSF on modeling uh, for uh, shared corridors with Metrolink, Losan, and our freight partner. We continue to work on that and identify critical uh, needs there. And as I mentioned, the uh, proposal in our plan is to invest $500 of our bookend funds. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, How much was that? Uh, whoops, let me go back. Five hundred million uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, Southern California uh, uh, area with uh, the Rosecrans Marquardt grade separation and, of course, the the work on the LA Union Station uh, project. I hope there's a defib machine near Hassan <laughs> right at this moment. So again, the, the building blocks under the plan to complete uh, our system, one, uh, you know, complete the Central Valley segment, uh, two, complete all phase one environmental uh, reviews, uh, fund the bookend projects with early regional benefits, foundation for future high-speed rail, uh, deliver Silicon Valley to Central Valley line in smaller bites, as I outlined uh, earlier, explore where we can find uh, initial service or interim service with early benefits and environmental benefit, uh, early mobility and environmental benefits, uh, and secure funding and financing for the completion of phase one as we move forward. Uh, I did uh, mention earlier that there's a complete chapter in the business plan, chapter four, which is dedicated to identifying important lessons that uh, the authority has learned uh, and uh, what we need to do going forward to apply those lessons to assure that we get to an efficient uh, delivery of this project. And I wanted to describe a few of those uh, in this presentation. Um, again, there's a lengthy uh, description of these things and some uh, uh, path uh, forward uh, on where we've been and where we need to go. But the first, just identifying some of the lessons learned and the things we need to do going forward is the, the authority did move into construction um, for good reasons, uh, but before all the risks were realized and full co costs were understood at the time of contract award in the Central Valley segment. Um, what I mean by this is you got into construction uh, early without having all the right-of-way in hand. Uh, that led to an, uh, increased risk on how we complete that right-of-way. Uh, and what other things that come with not having the right-of-way in hand uh, that you have to deal with, including third-party agreements, uh, utility relocations, railroad agreements. These are things that have been identified in prior business plans as risks that we have to deal with and manage in the Central Valley. Um, and I think the difference, one key difference between this business plan and those is that this business plan uh, puts dollars to those risks. In prior plans, they have been identified as risks that we have to be, that have to be dealt with. Uh, in this plan, uh, uh, we not only lay out what the dollars assigned to that risk is, uh, but how we will, will deal with these issues going forward. The important point here is that future construction contracts that the authority moves forward on will not repeat this mistake. Uh, we, we have to uh, procure and get into construction once these risks are more defined, they're incorporated in what we're doing, and we have those in hand and are managing those on the front end. Uh, the authority must complete its transformation from a planning organization to a project delivery organization. This is a, a bit of a process. In a very short amount of time, uh, the authority bit off uh, a lot on uh, moving to construction and becoming a construction entity. Uh, and we are in the process now of assuring that the authority has the full uh, capacity and uh, uh, skill set in place to, to uh, deliver uh, on the projects that we now have under contract. We are doing a, a good job of that with our RDB partner on uh, getting uh, the right personnel in the right places. And we've extended that with uh, the arrival of the first chief operating officer who's uh, really working closely with our RDP team and other senior uh, executives on uh, uh, getting this in place and making sure that we are a, a strong project delivery uh, operation. We are also in conversations now on filling a couple of other key positions, the Director of Real Property and the Director of Risk Assessment, which I uh, uh, am looking forward to announcing uh, soon, uh, who we hope to use to, uh, who we hope to bring on board uh, uh, to fill those positions as well. Um, a couple of other uh, important things that um, uh, will be part of the program 
going forward that we point out in the business plan is that it's, it's obviously important with the uh, announcement of the cost issues in the Central Valley that we adopt the new baseline budget against which uh, we can now manage the scope and the schedule uh, and, and the costs uh, in the Central Valley. Uh, that is uh, something I would expect the board to be presented with uh, as we adopt the final business plan. I think once you adopt the final business plan, the time is right to then uh, adopt the new baseline budget so that uh, uh, we can move forward on managing against that budget. Uh, as a matter of transparency, which I think is a very important element of any major uh, infrastructure project funded by the public that uh, we must expand our use of dashboards uh, to reflect to show pol policymakers and the public how the project is progressing uh, in real time against a set of performance metrics that I think will be clearer and easier to put in place uh, once we have the baseline budget in hand. Um, I noted, noted this earlier but uh, one of the things that uh, we felt strongly about is that we must change the way we estimate our out here project costs both to the public and uh, policymakers, and that was really for us here the uh, implementation or the inclusion of ranges uh, uh, for costs uh, that are uh, uh, where we're early in the project delivery uh, uh, process. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, estimate based on uh, work that we've uh, done during 2017, but we also want to uh, place those in the right context of a high and a low, uh, again, based on where we are in project development. Over time, you take that high and the low and you manage the project and those, those two lines, the high and the low, should converge as you go forward. And of course, our management goal is to come in uh, below our, our baseline uh, cost estimates now. Given our cost revisions, uh, I mentioned this earlier that uh, the other change is that we're looking to deliver the Valley to Valley uh, in smaller bites and I talked a little bit about uh, what that means already. It's important to uh, remember why uh, this project remains an important project and it's one thing to describe your challenges and the things that you have to address going forward but it's also important to remind people why uh, we're doing this and why it's good for California. I typically describe these in three areas, uh, economic, environmental, and mobility. And, and these are the three things uh, when we talk about transportation investment we always I talk about how does a project deliver on these three scores and I have, uh, at least in my time of working in transportation policy in this state, which is now almost a quarter of a century, uh, I have never uh, been able to find one project that can, has the capability of delivering so much on each score and it's why I think this is so important to continue to move forward but just as a way of reminder, we are putting thousands of people to work under the economic matrix. Uh, in the Central Valley. We now have more than 1,700 tradespeople working on the project, 425 small businesses working on the project. Um, uh, the investment of our federal dollars alone in, this, in the uh, Central Valley has led to between five and six billion in economic uh, impacts that have ripple, rippled throughout the state. Uh, moving forward, obviously the linkage between Silicon Valley and Central Valley uh, provides a great opportunity for to deal with our jobs housing imbalance in the state. Uh, also important linkages and economic uh, centers for uh, companies to expand where they're located and how they work together and an opportunity for greater collaboration between our, our important um, social and public uh, uh, universities and healthcare centers and beyond. So there's great economic opportunity in our continuation uh, of this project. This is really for me the uh, the element I like to talk about the most, and that is the mobility benefits of this project. As I said, I, I've worked in transportation uh, for some time in this state, and it's hard to uh, you know, point to a project that can give you the kind of uh, time savings and mobility benefits that this one can. This is a chart that is, uh, or a graph uh, that, graphic that is in the business plan. Uh, but really, it, it's uh, an important demonstration on why we're doing this at all, and that is, this idea that you can really uh, cut in half, if not more, the travel times for Californians between destination points. And um, why, while there's alternatives to build uh, more freeways or expand airports or do all these things, the fact of the matter is that you know, cars traveling on highways in California cannot travel at 220 miles per hour, but a fast train can. And the impact of that is that you cut travel time significantly, uh, as you see, 
you know, today in California, if you want to take passenger rail uh, from Northern California to Southern California, it's either a 12-hour train trip or it's a seven-plus-hour train plus bus trip, and we can do so much better. And this project promises to do so much better. And so uh, this graph really describes that mobility benefit as to why, why we're moving forward on this project. Finally, the, the environmental or the sustainability benefits. This is a chart that's also in the plan. It comes out of work that's done uh, with the California Air Resources Board. But what it really depicts, the, the, uh, the uh, bar chart on the left, um, is an uh, estimation of uh, reductions in uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, through uh, investments made in uh, non-high-speed rail uh, 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 projects that uh, are now the recipients of some of the cap and trade funds. And on the right is the uh, reduction in those same emissions uh, from the high speed rail system when it's at full operations. Uh, the estimate tells us that, uh, you know, uh, operating this program uh, removes on the order of 365,000 cars uh, every year off the highways and streets of, uh, of California. So uh, obviously, huge environmental benefits, not to mention the uh, environmental uh, policies that are part of how we're building this project, the recycling of material, uh, the use of renewable energy to power the train, our commitment to clean stations and uh, sustainable stations, and of course the transit land use uh, benefits uh, that, that this project delivers. Um, that, is, as I said, is sort of a high level um, uh, look at the plan. Uh, as, as I stated earlier, we really kicked off the beginning of the 60-day public comment period on the march toward the adoption of the final plan. Uh, we, we do that uh, uh, between uh, March and, and May. We'll have a hearing of this body in April, uh, another one uh, in May, where we would bring the uh, final plan in for adoption before the board. Uh, there will certainly be legislative hearings that we look forward to as well. And uh, we list here several ways that the public can comment uh, on the plan. And uh, as I noted, I, there's uh, just more here at the end. Um, we can receive, uh, obviously, that we've received some comments on the plan today. We'll have an April 17th board meeting in Los Angeles. And then at the May 15th meeting uh, in San Jose, we would propose to uh, adopt the final plan and submit it to the legislature uh, by the June 1st deadline. Uh, so again, Mr. Chairman, members with that, uh, I uh, am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I uh, appreciate the comprehensive nature of that oversight and also want to take this opportunity to thank you and all the members of the staff who worked on this. Uh, I know that this was a Herculean effort to get this uh, product done. Uh, clearly, uh, you would have liked more time, um, but uh, in discussions with the legislature, we worked out a, a date and, um, and you met that date. So. Mr. Chairman, if I could, I, w I just would be remiss if I, I didn't uh, mention my personal appreciation for all of the staff who worked uh, tremendously hard on this, both on the consultant side and the staff at High Speed Rail. I assure you it was a lot of long days and long nights, but uh, uh, well worth it and um, uh, pleased that we're moving forward on this. But I want to recognize the team that worked on this and, and say publicly how much I personally appreciate that effort. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it's uh, nice to see the dedication of the folks who are working on this. Um, board members, uh, do you have questions at this time for uh, our CEO, Mr. Kelly? Uh, Director Pascat. Thank you. Brian, thank you for the presentation and welcome. Thank you. As our new CEO. Thank you. There, there isn't a page number on this page, but the page that I'm looking at on your presentation <coughs> is doing business differently. <coughs> so the first bullet is probably the most important one to me in the entire presentation. The authority moved to construction before risks were realized and full costs were understood at the time of the contract award for the Central Valley segment. Um, I would say a lot of that drives the cost increases and uncertainty and maybe even potentially some of the um, support for the project. And so I'm glad that you put it in the presentation because I think it's a, an important point 
and I'm glad that you've identified it as an issue and a significant issue. Um, and I know that you're only in the job um, a short time, <coughs> but one, I would ask that you work with the executive team to try to come up with um, more information and transparency and a mitigation plan going forward. And then if you have any thoughts on this, because it is here in your presentation, um, about the plans that you have to address this, it would be uh, great to hear those either today or in the future. Uh, thank you. Um, there's, there's a couple of things to say about, uh, about this. The first is um, uh, there was an unusual set of circumstances uh, that, was, uh, that were presented before this board. At the, at the time, decisions were made to move forward on, on the construction projects. And it's important to note, there were good reasons to move forward uh, on the construction contracts. For example, uh, we had uh, federal funding that uh, we had to spend by a date certain uh, in this state on the order of two and a half uh, billion dollars. Uh, and putting those dollars to work have certainly had a positive economic impact in a part of the state that needed a boost uh, and uh, was uh, also uh, done at a time when um, uh, we were still coming out of a tough recession. Uh, so there was a, a, a time and period where uh, that investment has been uh, vitally important and we've seen impressive uh, benefits in that region from the project. I think one statistic I read recently is that between 2016 and 2017, about 30 percent of the job creation in Fresno County was tied to the high-speed rail project. That, that's an impressive uh, figure. So important uh, things have come with that. Uh, the, the downside, of course, is it is unusual. Uh, to get into a construction uh, award, uh, bid an award before uh, you have all the right of way in hand. And um, of the $2.8 billion uh, cost estimate increase that we've identified in the Central Valley, about 63% of that is really tied to, uh, uh, to this issue. Uh, it's tied to right of way costs that have uh, gone up through uh, delay and acquisition uh, prices going up. Uh, not all the things we knew about third-party agreements at the time of uh, award, uh, we now can assign some dollars to. And so, again, if 63% of the costs are, are tied to that, you can do a, a quite a bit of savings going forward by not, not repeating that. And so uh, that's an important uh, step as we move forward to uh, new construction uh, contracts. There are several other things that we are uh, working on. That I, I would say for the public's purpose and for the board's purpose, Chapter 4, in the business plan goes through um, a very uh, descriptive uh, uh, outlining of some of the challenges we face and then some of the moves uh, that we make going forward. Uh, we still have some challenges in right-of-way that we need to address. Uh, uh, some of that is tied to the process uh, at the state level uh, that we go through to get, uh, get uh, properties in hand. Uh, and we are, uh, we'll likely be working with our legislative partners, we hope, on um, options uh, there. Um, and uh, there's also uh, just steps on the ground that are important, too. I, I, we are working to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't expand our need of right-of-way uh, going forward, but that we find engineering solutions uh, that, that uh, diminish our need to acquire more right-of-way. Um, on the right-of-way question, it's worth noting, too, that uh, the magnitude of the right-of-way needed for the project is, is huge. And um, the authority has successfully uh, acquired on the order of 1,300 properties, which, just to put that in some perspective, uh, the California Department of Transportation, for all projects that it manages in the state of California on an annual basis, uh, which is, you know, at any one time is an $11 billion program, uh, they acquire about 800, between 750 and 800 uh, parcels a year, uh, and so this project is, has acquired uh, double that, and we need to do more, but as we move forward, there's a couple of things. One, make sure we uh, can limit additional right-of-way that may be required going forward by working closely with the uh, contractor to not expand right-of-way needs. Uh, that's an important uh, uh, element as we move forward, and then also to work uh, very closely to identify the most critical parcels you need first, and getting those in hand. Uh, so that uh, we can uh, put together the, uh, the, the uh, construction plan uh, going forward uh, locally. So there's a couple of things we're doing uh, on that front now. We're bringing in a new 
right away director shortly, which I mentioned earlier we'll be announcing. Uh, I'm looking forward to that uh, on or about the beginning of April. So there's several things we're, we're doing, and as I mentioned as well, our COO has made several trips down to the field, and we're working uh, 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 with our contractors down there to uh, you know, make sure uh, going forward that we're on a, a good place to deliver the, the contracts. So, Mr. Chair, if, if I may, the, and thank you, Brian, that's helpful and thoughtful, and I look forward to hearing more. As we look at this business plan over the next couple of months, and we look at um, uh, doing business differently, as Mr. Kelly suggested, I would also ask um, you as chair and my fellow board members to consider maybe adding a bit more process to support the effort to do business differently and take a hard look at some of these issues that created these risks and how they'll be addressed in the future and perhaps um, promote more public transparency at the board level. And so um, maybe you can think about that and we can have it as an agenda item at the next board meeting, but it would be nice to have new committees and new opportunities to really sort through a lot of these major issues and risks um, in a public setting. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Mr. Kelly? Uh, Director Curtin. Now, I don't really have a question, I just wanna- uh, Yeah, comments also. My, uh, sure. Pleasure to the- <coughs> Danny, I'm not to sure your mic, your- Oops, is it on, it is on? I don't. Uh, thank you for taking the job, it's gonna be a tough job. And, uh, our new COO, Joe Hedges. Uh, I'm already we're seeing some clarity in the decision-making process and the dispute resolution issues that have uh, plagued us in many, many cases. So um, I'm just congratulating both of you and look forward to working with you and moving this ball forward. Okay. <coughs> Director Camacho. Yes, um, Brian, you mentioned uh, lessons learned and Certainly, if in fact we're going to go forward, we need to look back and see what hampered our progress. You mentioned that we had, uh, in terms of right away, 1,400 parcels of land. But to me, the number of parcels is less important than the number of contiguous parcels that we, ought, we, we clear. And I think that that's been perhaps one of our um, roadblocks is that we haven't presented to the contractor enough contiguous pieces of property so that they can actually get some forward prog progress. And I'm glad you recognize that uh, that in, in your lessons learned. So I, I certainly have been a proponent of right away and, and trying to clear that. And so I'm, uh, I'm grateful that you've recognized that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, well, uh, oh. just a quick one. If Vice I'm Chair on. Richards. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I just wanted to make sure I thought I was hearing what you might be thinking about with regards to future uh, construction phases and it, in terms of reducing risk, and it, I think, falls uh, partially on the back of what uh, Ernie just said, but is it is it the intention then of uh, management and staff that as we start new construction in the aid or in the help uh, to reduce risk that the intent is to secure right of way before we start construction? Yes. <laughs> Certainly to the maximum extent feasible, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much uh, again for that. And uh, let me just um, re-emphasize. I, I do have one other thing. I'm sorry if I may. <laughs> okay. Uh, in, because it's been so critical also, and one of the big hurdles that we've had is, is not only right-of-way, but third-party agreements. Mm. So I assume, uh, as we have talked about before, uh, a good deal of work with those third-party uh, partners, uh, utilities, et cetera, to, get, to really define cost locations and those kinds of things again. Uh, during the early planning stages so we don't have as many hiccups in the development of the uh, right-of-way and amended uh, requirements that we have as we've seen in the past. Yeah, I, you know, I think that the they really go hand in hand. Uh, when you are securing your right-of-way, you've laid out your path forward, um, you know, the, the third-party agreements, uh, utility relocations, uh, much of that is uh, 
known and established and you can incorporate uh, in what you're now then presenting as a cost to construct and move forward. And so I think the idea is to establish all of that um, okay. early. Great, thank you. Sorry, Dan. No, that's all right. Uh, let me just reemphasize what uh, uh, Mr. Kelly said uh, about ways to communicate public's uh, input uh, to the program. Please uh, note that you can do that through uh, the internet, through direct phone calls to us, through letters, and of course by appearing uh, at our board meeting. Uh, next one will be April 17th in Los Angeles. Um, I want to move uh, quickly to. Um, I want to move quickly to the items that we have uh, in front of us. I don't think we need to spend 20 minutes on each one. Uh, so that's just a, uh, a heads up to Mr. Ogle. Um, since the board package, uh, which has also been presented to the public, is fairly complete. So let's move to item three, uh, which is uh, consideration of additional funding for uh, uh, CP1, construction package one. Mr. Ogle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow directors. Um, I'm here to present three items, and yes, I hope to not be up here um, longer than 20 minutes for all three. All right. The first one is to consider additional funding for the design build package for contract CP1. The authority is asking to augment the contingency of $20 million to administer the Herndon mitigation change. The Herndon mitigation change was primarily driven by the avoidance of a major PG&E gas line that's under the San Joaquin River. The avoidance of this gas line would avoid regulatory and resource agency mitigations. This change also assisted in the agreement negotiations with UPRR and this change or part of this change is documented in the ECM agreement that we have with UPRR. It also resolved traffic circulation issues with the City of Fresno at Herndon Avenue and Golden State Boulevard. <coughs> and it avoided project, major project delays due to the avoidance of this relocation of this pg and gas line, which would have included environmental clearance, additional environmental clearance and additional permits in the San Joaquin River. This change also allowed for the construction of the San Joaquin River viaduct and the pergola to begin construction much earlier. And so the authority is here to ask the board to augment the contingency fund by adding $20 million to help us execute the Herndon mitigation change. Move the item, Mr. Like, Chair. Like Second. Okay. Um, I didn't see who moved it. Was it Ms. Lowenthal or was it Ms. Shank? No, Pascal. Oh, it's, okay, Director Pascal. So I knew it was somewhere down there. Um, moved by Director Pascal and I think seconded by Director Camacho. Um, Secretary, please call the roll. Director Shank? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Director Curtin? Yes. Director Paskett? Yes. Director Lowenthal? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Chair Richard? Yes. Uh, one second before you go to the next item, just a quick question for the CEO. On all three of these changes, um, their, their increases, are they included in the, in the revised baseline budget? In the yes, they there. are. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, item four uh, for the PCM contract for CP1. Item four, considering amending the project and construction management PCM contract for construction package one and issuing a request qualification to re-procure PCM services. By way of uh, introduction here, um, the authority elected to use the PCM consultants as the authority's primary resource for the staff to provide oversight and management of design build contracts. The PCM teams provide a unique and critical project level services in, man in the management of the design construction projects for various segments of the high speed rail system. CP1 design build contract and PCM contracts were awarded before the development of performance metrics and many of the authority's current policies and procedures. The CP1 PCM contract was not sufficiently funded during the initial negotiation due to the lack of understanding of the magnitude of the work ahead and the lack of guiding parameters of the value of the PCM services. 
This was further compounded with the additional scope that was added to the design build contract and the PCM contract, plus a significant time extension for the DB contract. All of these without any additional funding to the PCM. In October 2017, at this board meeting, the staff um, the staff agreed or committed to perform a programmatic review of all PCMs and provide pra pragmatic options to extend the reprocure or to extend the existing contracts or reprocure. The programmatic review looked at five main key items of areas. It was the implementation of the existing board, existing best management practice, establish the PCM performance metrics, streamline the PCM staffing levels, review the ICE, the I independent checking engineer and the independent site engineer, and perform a quality assessment for the PCM <coughs> contracts. Staff's presentation of the results of the programmatic assessment has yielded that all er that there were areas of improvement for all three PCMs under the current, under the contract with authority. A number of corrective actions and nonconformance reports have been issued to each of the PCMs. However, and this is where I'd like to stress, however, Wong Harris has been responsible in addressing the number of NCRs and will propose additional staff to address the concerns raised in this assessment. The authority staff has determined that Wong Harris team is particularly has been instrumental in administering the oversight of, of CP1 contract. Specifically related to Wong Harris, which is the subject of this board action under item four, Wong Harris has made positive adjustments since November 2017, which include the following. The addition of Glenn Souter to lead their PCM, a high level manager from, from Harris, the addition of a senior quality manager, revised audit plan schedules, internal and external audits, updated construction management plan, updated project quality control plans, the development of training programs and schedule of QMP revisions, the reduction of submittal backlog, and the added, of, added a risk management consultant. Also, as, quality, as this part of this quality assessment, the authority identified that we need to look at starting from ground zero again and look at identifying roles and expectations for our PCMs and then as authority closely monitoring and, and evaluating those PCMs on a, on a more regular basis. Staff is here to recommend that we extend Wong Harris's contract for $28.5 million through December of 2019. Wong Harris has worked with the authority staff to accelerate key, key part, critical parcels leading to early start of construction initiated of discussions of permit agencies, reduce the biological monitoring requirements and streamline documentation, perform due diligence, design due diligence reviews, resulting in cost savings, coordinated and facility third party utility relocations, and navigated highly complex third party utility relocations. This time, Steph would recommend that uh, the board approve PCM to extend with $28.5 million, $28 million through December of 2019. I move approval. Okay, it's been moved by Director Camacho. Second. Seconded by Vice Chair Richards. Um, will Secretary <clears throat> please call the roll? Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Can I ask a question? Also? Yeah, of course, of course. I should have asked if there were questions first. Um, Mr. Kelly, how does this fit in with doing business differently? In this case, um, the staff did a pretty thorough assessment of the, the PCMs uh, for all three of the uh, contracts, uh, CPs 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, the issue here is we've had an expansion of scope uh, on, on, uh, on CP 1, uh, and uh, there's a new uh, commitment, as Terry uh, laid out here, on enhanced uh, oversight of the PCMs as we move forward. Uh, and uh, because CP1 is, a, is the contract that we are uh, uh, making, 
how do I want to say it, that we are progressing the most aggressively on in the region. Um, I think the idea of introducing uh, any new uh, risk down there by, you know, for lack of a better term, changing horses midstream is unwise. Uh, and would, would propose that uh, with the enhanced oversight that uh, the authority staff is committed to, the work uh, that the PCM has already done, uh, and uh, the work that we need them to continue to do going forward, uh, I think it is the, the best path forward to, to deliver the, the, uh, the construction uh, package. So, Mr. Kelly, my concern is that we've had some issues in the past with oversight and construction management, and uh, from the board materials, it looks like this firm has been with us for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I'm not convinced that this is doing business differently by not changing horses. Um, I'm not going to oppose it today. But my concern is that we've had substantial cost increases. We've had some uncertainty around the project. We're now switching our um, cost estimates. Um, we're in the process of identifying risks for this portion of the project. And so I'm not sure going through the end of next year, um, and having that much of a runway to um, not make a change is prudent for this board. Um, maybe there's an amendment to the resolution where you are, you are given the authority to renegotiate and um, pursue an amendment, but maybe it's not all the way out through the end of next year, or there's a requirement that in three to six months um, this comes back before the board and we hear an update on whether or not in fact, we are doing business differently and we're starting to mitigate risks with the assistance of this contractor. I'm just concerned I'm looking, that, yeah. we haven't, that we have a new approach, but we're not making a lot of changes to execute on that new approach. Um, a couple of things. As I said, there's three different PCM contractors on the three different contracts down there. They are all undergoing uh, current assessment uh, and oversight, and that's a continuous effort as we go forward. I have no problem with the suggestion that we come before the board uh, six months, three months, whatever the board uh, needs to describe uh, where we are uh, moving forward. Uh, I would also say that even with the extension here, uh, these contracts all have termination clauses that are uh, common uh, in, in contracts as we move forward and that we have an opportunity to execute those whenever we see fit. Uh, as we manage this going forward. The commitment that I'm making here and my team is making here is uh, certainly an enhanced oversight and a total willingness to come before this board and update where we are in the performance uh, of this PCM as we move forward. Uh, with that said, I would still uh, urge the board to approve the resolution uh, so that we don't introduce any new risk on the development of CP1 uh, in the region. What's the termination clause? Um, I'm looking at council, but uh, I know that generally these contracts have, uh, you know, either for cause or for convenience uh, opportunities to um, uh, terminate. Tom, you want to add, add anything? Yeah, these uh, architectural and engineering. Why don't you go to the microphone? This is uh, Authority Council Tom Fillens. Uh Yes, these uh, architectural and engineering contracts um, do have termination clauses, so the owner has the opportunity to make a change and um, can re-procure if, they, if the, the board chooses to. And what is um, that, Mr. Philens? Is it 30 days? Mm, I'd have to look. I don't recall what the exact uh, period is for this one, but I can report back. So if the maker of the motion would entertain a substitute motion to add an amendment to the resolution for a report back in 90 days on the status of this. Mr. Camacho, she's asking if you would accept that as a friendly amendment to your motion. I need to hear it. I'm sorry. Um, Director Pasquet asked if you would uh, incorporate into your motion to move the contract uh, amended language to direct the staff to return before the board in 90 days to update the board on the progress of the PCM and fulfilling the, uh, uh, fulfilling the objectives. Is that an accurate uh, recitation? It is. <clears throat> I'm fine with it. Okay, that'll be included in the in the motion. My second stands. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, will the secretary please call the roll on the motion as amended? Okay. Director Shank. 
Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Director Curtin? Yes. <clears throat> Director Paskett? Yes. Director Lowenthal? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Chair Richard? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Ogle? Item number five is to consider amendment of the agreement with Caltrans for the state route 99 contract. The authority entered into an agreement with Caltrans back in 2013 to relocate SR 99 in the limits of CP1. This included design, right of way acquisition, utility relocation, as well as construction of that particular contract. We are requesting an additional $29.2 million for that contract. This $29.2 million is for right-of-way acquisition, utility relocation, and loss of business goodwill. The reason for this increase is 22 out of the 41 parcels on the, on the SR99 project has gone through the eminent domain process, and all 41 parcels have the potential loss of business goodwill. Caltrans, in their initial estimated, estimated that 10 properties would go into eminent domain and 10 properties would go into loss of business goodwill. Utility relocation cost for PG&E and AT&T is increased higher than and, and estimated and we've experienced this as well on CP1 and CP23 as we've been relocating these utilities in, in our project as well. Staff is recommending that we issue a 29.2 contract amendment to the Caltrans agreement it is anticipated that Caltrans will need this budget this fiscal year as they expect to receive court judgments, loss of business goodwill settlements, and utility invoices before the end of the fiscal year. Move the item. Second. Um, before you move it, are there any questions from members? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vice Chair Richards does have a question. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Ogle. Can you, uh, I want to make sure that, I, that I'm correct in what I'm saying. The right-of-way has all been uh, under the uh, responsibility and control of uh, Caltrans under this contract, is that correct? Yes, sir. And there has been no right-of-way efforts uh, or any of the right-of-way having been assembled with high-speed rail authority staff or consultants? Um, there were a few parcels, I believe two parcels that were uh, looked at for high-speed rail um, that we, we took over and we took the the responsibility for payment. Um, High-speed rail right-of-way staff is always involved in the Caltrans um, negotiations and in the Caltrans um, process. They, they consult with consult with us, our right-of-way staff, before they go through with their execution of that right-of-way agreement. Was there a reason that we took over those two parcels? It was a, it was a funding it was a funding issue at that time. Uh, could you explain that? Um, right, the right away, right away funding for this twenty-nine point two million dollars. Oh, they didn't have the money. They did. They did. Caltrans did not have the money. Okay, thank you, and Mr. Chairman. One, one quick question. Yes, director. All the dollars that we are approving today are all contemplated in the rebaselining of dollars. Is that correct? Yeah, that's yes. correct. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Uh, the Item has been moved by Ms. Pasquette. I didn't hear who gave the second. Sorry. Director Lowenthal gave the second. Uh, would secretary <clears throat> please call the roll? Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Director Curtin? Yes. Director Pasquet? Yes. Director Lowenthal? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Chair Richard? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ogle. Thank you. Okay, our last item uh, is um, uh, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I should have noted earlier when we came out of closed session that we had nothing to report from the closed session. So, General Counsel's nodding. Um, item six, uh, consideration of amending the right-of-way support services contract with Beak and Scott Jarvis. Mr. Yes, Jarvis. good morning, Mr. Good morning. Chairman, Board of Directors, and CEO Kelly. My name is Scott Jarvis, and I'm presenting an action item to recommend approval of an amendment to the Hamner, Jewel, and Associate contract. It's referred to as the Beacon contract to increase the total contract amount permitting Beacon to continue providing essential right-of-way services to the authority which will be necessary to complete the work in the Central Valley. 
Now, in September of 2014, the board authorized contracting with eight specific right-of-way service providers, including Beacon, with the total not to exceed amount of $35 million. The funds allocated may be apportioned between the eight service providers as necessary. As has been discussed, since 2014, the right-of-way program has grown considerably in the Central Valley. Construction package one through four initially contemplated the need for a little over 1,200 parcels, but as design and construction has progressed, the total number of parcels required for construction has increased to over 1,900. Beacon was initially assigned 196 parcels for acquisition, and consistent with the overall increase in parcel acquisition, the number was increased by an additional 58 parcels to 254 parcels. So Beacon is a high-performing right-of-way service provider and an asset to the authority. Um, they've successfully delivered highly complex parcels, and many of the remaining parcels involve complex acquisitions from property owners with whom Beacon already has relationships with. Therefore, approving the amendment will allow Beacon to complete the acquisition of all 254 parcels assigned to it in an efficient manner without the need to reassign the work to other potentially less effective right-of-way service providers. All of this funding is included in the rebaselining exercise um, for this contract augmentation. So thus, staff recommends that the board approve an amendment to the agreement with Beacon to add $977,000 which would increase the total amount of the Beacon contract to $5,977,000. So I would right. be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions for Mr. Jarvis? Move approval. Moved by Director Camacho. Second. Seconded by Vice Chair Richards. Would the Secretary please call the roll? Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Director Curtin? Yes. Director Paskett? Director Lowenthal? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Chair Richard? Yes. Okay, that completes uh, today's agenda. I want to thank all the members of the public for coming here today. Uh, thank my colleagues. With that, this meeting of the High Speed Rail Authority Board is adjourned. Good.